A while ago, I posted a video on how I made a 2D GPU soft body physics simulation. In this video, we will be making some upgrades to that project so that it also supports three dimensional soft bodies. As with the 2D version of this project, the final product is by no means robust and there are still a lot of bugs to iron out. With that being said, let's jump right into the video. 3D soft body simulations differ a lot from 2D soft body simulations. So we're basically starting from zero. Just like for 2D soft body simulations, we need a way to detect when a point is inside of a shape so that we can successfully resolve a collision. In 2D, this is done by extending an infinite horizontal ray to the right of our point and counting the number of intersections between this ray and the shape. An odd amount of intersections means that we are inside of the shape and an even or zero amount of intersections means that we are outside of the shape. This same logic works in a 3D mesh. Except this time the math is a lot harder. Instead of handling a ray edge intersection in two dimensions, we need to find out whether a ray intersects a triangle in 3D. Because 3D meshes are ultimately just made up of triangles. So how do we go about writing a ray triangle intersection algorithm? Well, we can divide the algorithm into two steps. First, using the equation of the plane on which our triangle lies, we can parametrically solve for where our ray would intersect on this plane. We can then check whether this point lies within the triangle by converting its coordinates to barycentric coordinates and using those coordinates to see if it is within the bounds of our triangle. To see if our intersection point is inside of the triangle, we can calculate the barycentric coordinate of our intersection point. To put it simply, each component of our barycentric coordinate is a weight which will be placed at a respective vertex of our triangle. The final position of our point is basically the center of mass of these three weights. Making every component 0 but 1 makes our point float around each vertex of our triangle. If we make each barycentric coordinate 1 third, we've placed equally weighted mass points at each vertex that all add up to 1, and this means the barycentric point will be at the center of the triangle. This is cool and all, but why are barycentric coordinates useful? Well, let's see what happens when one of the coordinates is negative. Hmm, it seems that we can tell if a point is outside of the triangle by seeing if a component of the barycentric coordinate of that point is negative. With the conceptual part of the problem out of the way, let's see how we can actually calculate barycentric coordinates from regular coordinates. Let b1, b2, and b3 represent the components of our barycentric coordinate, and let b1, b2, and b3 correspond to the points p1, p2, and p3 on our triangle. We can start off with a system of equations. Our first equation issues a constraint that our barycentric coordinate should be normalized, not in the traditional sense but in the sense that the components of our barycentric coordinate should all add up to 1. The second equation offers us a way for us to convert our barycentric coordinate to a regular coordinate. It basically relates the coordinates on our triangle to our barycentric coordinate. B1 can be derived in terms of B2 and B3 using the first equation by merely moving B2 and B3 to the right side of the equation. We can then substitute b1 into our second equation to obtain a new equation without b1. Let v1 and v2 represent the edges of our triangle adjacent to the point p1. In other words, the vectors formed by subtracting p1 from p2 and p1 from p3. Additionally, let v3 represent the vector between our original point and p1. Using these three variables, which are all known values, we can simplify our equation to appear less complicated. Our goal is to find the unknowns of b2 and b3, however it is not really possible at the moment since we have two unknowns and only one equation. But the thing is, we can actually form two equations by taking the dot product of both sides of the equation by v1 and v2, which are not unknowns and are all known values. Then we can solve this system of equations using Cramer's rule, which gives us the value of b2 and b3 formulaically. We can then easily solve for b1 using our first equation by merely subtracting b2 and b3 from 1. I've now set up this visualization to calculate the barycentric coordinate of a point, which I will have perform circular motion around our triangle. When the point is outside of the triangle, it is easy to see that one of the components of our barycentric coordinate is negative. And I've made it even clearer by highlighting the component in red whenever it turns negative. So I did go a bit out of order by explaining barycentric coordinates first, but that was only because this is a much lesser known topic than ray plane intersections, and because I also spent a lot of time making a visualization for it and I wanted people to at least see that if they decided to quit off the video. 
Now let's go back in time and explain how we got the intersection point between our ray and the infinite plane on which our triangle lies. I'm going to explain this with the good old whiteboard approach because I feel like the solution to this problem is a lot more intuitive and less visually demanding than barycentric coordinates are. We can start off with the equation of a three-dimensional plane. If we define the normal vector as a vector consisting of the components a, b, and c, and define a point in space as a vector consisting of the components x, y, and z, we can rewrite the standard equation as the dot product of the normal vector and the point in space is equal to d or the denominator. Let's define a point on our infinite plane as a vector e. We can then use this vector e to define the denominator of our plane as the dot product of the normal vector and a point on the plane. Next, let's write the equation of our ray parametrically. We define the origin of our ray as a vector p and the direction of our ray as a vector d. A point along our ray which we can set to the vector x is then easy to define as p plus d times t. We can substitute this equation into our plane equation and also substitute the equation for the denominator of our plane to start deriving for the value of t, which will eventually allow us to solve for the intersection point of our ray and the infinite plane on which our triangle lies. After distributing the dot product, we have the final equation for t as n dot e minus p over n dot d. Using this information, we can successfully detect when point masses are inside of another object, but we have yet to find a way to actually resolve this collision. First things first, what is the best way to move our point masses so that a collision is no longer present between two objects? Well, a three-dimensional softbody simulation is new territory for me, so I don't actually know. So I'm going to take inspiration from the previous 2D version of this project and follow the same approach. In the 2D version of this project, collision resolution consists of three steps. First, find the closest perpendicular edge to our intruding point. Move the intruding point and the close edge along the normal vector of the edge so that they are no longer colliding. And finally, update the velocities of the point mass and the edge by treating the edge and the point as perfect spheres and using a preset coefficient of restitution to solve for their final velocities. We can pretty much apply this same approach to 3D collision resolution, except the math is a bit different for our first step, where we must find the closest perpendicular distance between the intruding point and a triangle instead of an edge. In 2D, taking the cross product of the edge vector and the point vector in unit space yields this value. But we have to run a ray triangle intersection check in 3D, where the ray's direction will now be the normal of each triangle in order to find the perpendicular distance. If they don't intersect, we obviously reject the triangle as a candidate for being closest to the point. Obviously this is going to be really expensive compared to the two-dimensional variant of collision resolution, but I couldn't really think of any other ways to solve this problem, so this is going to have to do for now. As mentioned before, we move the point masses involved in the collision, being the intruding point and the three points on the closest triangle along the normal vector of the triangle to resolve the collision position-wise. It should be noted that I also take into consideration the total mass of the triangle compared to the single point mass that is intruding when deciding how much the point should move. So once the position of our point masses is updated, we also need to update their velocities. Luckily, we can actually use the exact same approach in our 2D softbody simulation. In my previous video, I already derived this solution, so I'm going to reuse the visual from that video and just narrate over it. Let E represent the coefficient of restitution, a constant ranging from 0 to 1 depending on how elastic we want our collision to be. U1 and U2 are the initial velocities of our point in our triangle, and V1 and V2 are the final velocities of our point in our triangle, which are the two unknowns that we are attempting to solve for. The coefficient of restitution can be defined in terms of V1 and V2 like so. Additionally, we can apply conservation of momentum to this system to yield a second equation in terms of v1 and v2. Since we have two equations and two unknowns, it is very easy to derive a final equation for v1 and v2. This same derivation works for both 2D and 3D, which is something which I find very convenient. Let's spawn in a 3D model to see if our system is working correctly. The points are being moved outside of the cube and they're also bouncing upwards, so clearly our collision resolution is working correctly. At this point, we've basically finished up all the difficult parts of the simulation. All that's left is to make sure the softbody maintains its original shape somewhat by coding some constraints. There are two methods we will be employing to make sure this happens. First, we will insert three spring constraints for every triangle in our 3D shape. Basically, for every line drawn in this wireframe, there is a spring. 
This will make sure that our soft body sort of maintains its shape because our springs will make sure that the points are spaced based on how far they are originally from each other. Springs are pretty simple. You apply Hooke's Law to find the spring force and then add a damping force so that simple harmonic motion does not cause infinite oscillations. The second method we will employ is termed shape matching. This method consists of measuring the initial positions of the point masses on an object relative to its center of mass. Using these positions along with the current positions on an object to find an approximate angle, applying a rotation with that angle to the initial virtual positions to find new virtual positions, then stretching a spring between the virtual position and the current position to sort of pull point masses back into shape while also caring about rotation. This initially seems very difficult in 3D but it's actually not too bad. In 2D, we can simply find the angle between the two points of an object in its unrotated and virtual frame and average over all the points to find the approximate angle. But in 3D, rotations are not as easily represented as with a single float variable, which means we have to use quaternions. I don't think I'm really qualified to speak on quaternions, so I linked the article which I used to learn about quaternions below. To summarize my approach, I naively averaged the quaternions by just summing them up and then normalizing the quaternion which is actually an approach that does not yield accurate averages in every scenario, but this method is the least expensive method, and I also read online that it was suitable for averaging quaternions which are marginally similar to each other, and since we're going to be deforming the points to conform to a rotation anyway, I figured that the rotation would always converge on being similar to each other, so based on preliminary observation I was right and this approach actually worked pretty well in the end. And that is the end of the video. We've successfully implemented a 3D soft body simulation. There's definitely a lot that could be done to improve on this project. Obviously, we need to iron out some edge cases. You might have noticed that some of the point masses were detecting collisions when there were no collisions or reacting incorrectly to collisions when they were detected. We can also improve performance vastly by implementing some kind of spatial partitioning. I also now just realized I haven't really explained the GPU part of this simulation too much. Maybe I'll do so in a future video. Anyway, I hope this video was useful or interesting in some way. Remember to like and subscribe and I hope you have a wonderful day.